This is the Mental Metal Podcast, and I am your host, Coach Matt Toman. I'm a former athlete, teacher, coach, and athletic director that switched careers after surviving cancer and a stroke in the fall of 2020. But I'm also a dad of a son and a daughter that were successful high school athletes that went on to college. Now I use that experience along with my ICF coaching certification when helping teams, coaches, and athletes from all over the country. Each week, I will pose a specific question that will help coaches of all types better understand mental toughness. In the Mental Metal Podcast, coaches will learn to help their athletes overcome adversity without being the adversity they need to overcome. And welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Mental Metal Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Matt Tillman, and I'm here today with uh, my guest today, Margaret Lair. And Margaret's got a as everybody knows that I get the mental metal podcast is all about the connection between, you know, we're talking about mental toughness and developing mental toughness. I'm huge on the idea that you can create mental toughness. It's not just a gen, like this genetic gift that's bestowed on some people. Like you can create this and I'm always leaning into that and trying to find people that have put them like, one, I talk to people that have been through tough situations and what they've learned. And I've also talked to people that purposely put themselves in bad situations or in, I don't know if the word bad is there, uh, but, but difficult situations is fair. And because I think that there's benefit of both and putting yourself in tough situations on purpose is, I think, one of the best ways that we can really grow and, and, and get better. And the reason I mentioned that with, uh, my guest today, Margaret Lair, is Margaret is a girl, high school girls wrestling coach. And this is for the state of Illinois, correct? Uh, walk me through a little bit. There's so many ways we're going to go with this, but I know that is this the first year for IHSA girls wrestling? No, uh, actually, this was we just had our third state tournament. Okay, um, so the it, so, but it's very it's fairly new in far yes. in as far as the state series goes. Correct, as far okay. as the state series goes, yes. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that, the history of all that coming to fruition and, and existing. Okay. Um, well, I'm part of the history. Of I know. And, and, I, and I wanted you to tell that. And I don't want to lead, lead from that, but I think it's yeah. awesome. But yeah, yeah. go so, for it. So, I mean, that's a, that's a great place to start, I guess, for, for my story and my perspective on it. Um, so Title IX just celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. Um, and if you're not familiar with Title IX, uh, I'm not going to go in. I know you are, but um, if others <laughs> listening are not familiar with Title IX, I'm not going to go into the depths of that. But um, it's something worth looking into. You, but it it allows provisions for females to compete in athletics when um, opportunities are not equal opportunities are not available for them separately. Right. So um, my history related to that is that 30 years ago I made the choice to compete on my high school wrestling team um, at Libertyville High School up in the suburbs, and um, this was back in the early 90s and. I ultimately, at the time, did not know that I was the first. And um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't. Was, it wasn't like I'm gonna go be a trailblazer. It's just no, like, oh, I just want to go do it. Yeah, it was just a decision that I made. That uh, it was actually a friend and I in eighth grade. We said, hey, we should go out for the wrestling team. Sounds interesting. Um, neither of us had family history of it. We didn't have, uh, you know, older brothers that had participated in it. Neither of my like my dad hadn't wrestled uh, anything like that. I really had no experience. It was just we decided, hey, why not? Let's okay. Try. Well, time out. Time out. Time out. There's <laughs> got to be like, like. <laughs> I mean, it, it feels a little bit like me in eighth grade saying, you know what? I think I'm going to go be a ballerina, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it it kind of is, I guess. Yeah, because um, I guess reflecting on it now, we probably were uh, this particular friend and I probably were. Um, in some ways, maybe boundary pushers in some ways, not in the sense that we were troublemakers or anything like that, but we both, um, we've reconnected in adulthood. Uh, we kind of fell away in our teen years and then have reconnected in adulthood. And we both grew up with very strong moms and, um, who, who spoke to us about 
the fact that we could do anything we set our minds to. And so we lived life that way, even as middle school students. And so we just said, hey, like, why not? When I was an eighth grader, did I recognize that? No, definitely not. It was just, we decided, let's give it a try. We went and we talked to the wrestling coach and he pretty much laughed in our face. Uh, I, I can imagine. So I, I, I mean, I know a lot of wrestling coaches and, and no offense to any wrestling coaches because you are one as well. And, and you're, right. and you're, and you're married and your husband's a wrestling coach too, right? Correct. Correct. I, like 30 years ago, most of them I know, like, I think that you, them laughing in your faces is, is pretty much across the board of what you would have expected. Definitely. Uh, yeah. The reaction back in the nineties, definitely, um, at a middle school, especially, uh, we were eighth graders. He pretty much told us, uh, the, the way he kind of shooed us off was, Oh, we definitely can't have girls on the team. Um, they, you know, you have to weigh in naked or in your underwear. And so like, that just can't be a thing, which granted at the time the there definitely was like weighing in naked or in the underwear, you know, to get to the lowest weight possible. But, um, you know, no, no potential thought of how could we accommodate this situation? Oh, you know, and, that, and I'm, well, I mean, that from, from a, from a uh, perspective of being an administrator, being in a coach and it's like, yeah, he's, uh, he had to be thinking this is, would, would be so much work. I, I can't right. even like, I don't want to, ha and I don't want it to be a spectacle. I don't want it to be like a big deal. And there's right. no way it's not going to be a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so ultimately, you know, that eighth grade year, we just kind of said, eh, OK, not now. And then my freshman year rolled around and I made the decision again that I really was serious about it and wanted to give it a try. And um, I went to um, my coach at Normal West or not at Normal West High School, but at Libertyville High School. And uh, his name is Dale Eggert and he is still the coach there and he is an amazing man. But um, he recognized the situation for what it was. Um, he didn't laugh in my face. He was definitely taken by surprise and he thought about it. Um, and ultimately he came back and he he grew up in the sport. Um, he was state champion multiple times. He wrestled in college, you know, all the things. He knew the sport inside and out. And he asked me the questions that he needed to ask. Have you ever done this sport before? Do you know what you're getting yourself into? How, do you have any experience with anything like this? And all my answers were no. And so his, his comeback was, how about this first year you come in, be a manager for our team, keep stats for our team, and learn about the sport? before you make this decision. And I said, okay, I'll do that. So my freshman year, ultimately I was a manager for the team. I kept stats for the team. I learned about the sport and I decided, yeah, I wanna do this. And so then my sophomore year when I came back and was serious about it, um, we did have to you know, work things out with the school district, um, had to have conversations with the superintendent because they knew, I, they recognized the potential for you know, feedback, kickback, um, fights potentially from other districts of, whoa. Um, and, but because of Title IX and the protections that that provides, they also knew they couldn't say no. And so, so there I was. Yeah. Um, and then fast forward 30 years and my, well, less than 30 years, uh, I married my husband who is a wrestling coach. I continued to be around the sport my entire adult life. Ultimately, my children uh, both made the decision to wrestle, um, not by force, but by choice, because of my husband and I know, um, and if you know anything yeah. about the sport, that's not something you can force kids to do. Um, but both of our children made the choice to wrestle. Uh, our son started in middle school, and then our daughter, ultimately, uh, her freshman year in high school, made the decision to join as well. Um, and then girls wrestling became sanctioned in the state uh, officially became sanctioned in 2020 but with covid and delays and things like that our first state tournament didn't actually happen until 2022 so it was the 21 22 season um, but 2022 was our first state tournament so so i love i love the whole story there but at one point you said flash forward 
30 years and I'm not okay with that. So I want to <laughs> like, there's a lot in between, right? No, I mean, and that's what I'm saying. There's a whole lot in between there. It, mostly in, I, I love, I love the way that your high school coach did with like dealt with that. Now, ultimately they had to do something because it, that's title nine, but, right. but I love the way that he, he gave you the opportunity. He kind of gave you an out for a year mm-hmm. to be like, you, you, you sure you want to watch this? And mm-hmm. are you sure this is what you want to do? Um, at what point was there any point where you're like, you know what? You're right. This isn't what I want to do. Or were you, were you, did you stay pretty committed? You're like, I've, this is it. I want to do it. Um, before I actually started. Yeah. Yes. My, my feelings didn't waver. Once I actually started, <laughs> there are moments over and over oh. again where uh, I think in any athletic, but especially sports like wrestling that are so intense and it's just you, right? It's just you and your opponent and, you know, you can't count on anybody else to help you through it. Um, so there are many times over where I thought, I don't know if this is the right thing for me, but... Normally, I, I I would say a year ago, I would have no idea what you're talking about. I guess I've done some running and races, which is by yourself, but it's not quite the same. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, it was like a year ago when I picked up jujitsu for the first time at 47 years old. And I was yeah. like, oh, okay. I um, get it. I get yeah. it. I get it. Yeah. Like, I'm getting absolutely destroyed right here and nobody's coming. Like, it's, right. I got no to figure this out. You. Yeah. Yep. No one's coming for you. No one, you can't. You can't blame it on anyone else if you have a bad day. You can't um, count on anyone else to pick you up when you're falling apart. Um, it, it's just you, you know. And and I experienced that for the first time at at forty seven, being oh six four, two hundred and forty pounds. And you experienced that for the first time at. 15 five years tall. old, yeah, 14 15 years, 15 years old, five feet tall, 103 pounds is what I wrestled and at. going against guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my entire high school career, I never competed against another girl. No, I don't. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, Not I'd once. be so shocked if you did. Yeah. By my senior year, there were other girls in the state who had started competing, especially at the IEAS IESA level. So the middle school level, right. um, you know, there were other girls who ended up coming through the program at Libertyville high school. One in particular was a few years behind me and she was quite successful. Um, I think she was the first to make it to the sectional level, um, in the state series. And so, um, but yeah, my, my entire high school career, I only ever competed against boys. Yeah. And, uh, how do you like, what was, I don't want to take this the wrong way or anything like, but how was your success level? Um, not great. Not yeah, great. I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, being brand new to the sport as a high school student is not typical. Being someone who had never had any experience in any sort of contact sport is not typical. Um, and then the, I stayed at 103 pounds competing my entire high school career. Um, I was pretty much done growing uh, by the time I entered high school. So I had that going for me, at least, that I was able to maintain at a right. lower weight. So I was typically wrestling primarily against freshmen and sophomore competitors because they were um, they were the ones that are typically smaller. And um, But even still, at even at 103 pounds and even wrestling younger competitors, the strength to weight ratio for girls compared to boys is different. It's just yeah. different. We're, we're anatomically built differently. We are, you know, our balance is different where our strength lies is different, where our flexibility is, is different. And, um, so that, you know, that stayed the same my entire high school career of just, well, yeah. That. And the sport of wrestling is, is, was originally and set up for guys. Correct. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> so right. yeah. yeah. The original Olympic sport. Yeah, absolutely. 
No amount of athletic talent or physical ability can overcome a poor mindset. Anxiety, fear, and negativity will always diminish an athlete's abilities and limit their success. If you're not intentionally developing your child's mental toughness, then they are not reaching their full potential. Mental Mental Coaching provides the individual drills needed to build the positive mindset necessary for success on the court and in life. Contact today to schedule a free coaching session and start building mental toughness in your athlete. Metal is a person's ability to face adversity in a spirited and resilient manner. It is a great skill to have for athletics and for life, but it is not something we are born with. If you want it, you have to forge your metal. And if you listen to the Mental Metal Podcast, you already know that, but not everybody else does yet. So help me out by ordering and wearing some sweet The Mental Metal Podcast gear. We've got short sleeve tees, long sleeve tees, and some super comfortable hoodies. Order online today and you can have your gear in no time. But the best part is that every order helps support the show and helps me spread the message that mental toughness is a trait that can and should be built. So find the link in the show notes, order your gear, and start showing that you know how to forge your metal. Um, So where's the... And I'm sure that, you know, we could talk all day about the the struggles you had as an athlete on the mat, right? Mm-hmm. But there had to be some resistance and struggles that came with, with it off the mat as well. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there are definitely struggles, physical struggles on the mat, but the um, social component, the emotional component, um, you know, I... I experienced the gamut. I had people who supported me, adults and children. I had people who hated me for what I did, adults and children. I had people that um, were afraid of me for what I did, adults and children. Like every time my peers thought I was crazy or my peers thought I was awesome. Um, Adults, I, I have an entire box full of letters that I got from people all over the United States. And again, those even ranged from, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're doing this. This is amazing to you shouldn't be on the mat. This shouldn't be allowed. This is, this is against everything of how things should be in sport. And it's wrong for girls to be competing against boys. And, um, so, so yeah, there's, there were a lot of challenges. Um, I definitely lost friends over it. I, um, got teased for it. But then I also experienced the flip side, you know, of being fully supported and embraced for it. Um, you know, I had amazing teammates. I have some that I'm still in contact with to this day who 100% supported me. Uh, one of my good friends, Justin Messman, he lives out in Washington and he is one of, um, he now coaches a girls wrestling team out in Washington. His daughter wrestled, his son and daughter both wrestled, but his daughter wrestled. He got into coaching. He now still continues to coach and he's one of the best. And he, he talks to me all the time. He said, you were such a huge influence just watching everything that you went through and were willing to go through and continue to go through in order to just be part of this sport and part of this team. And, um, so yeah, the, there's a lot. Um, and, and the, the, the thing about that box of letters and, and just that gamut of emotions, it's awesome to get the support. It's awful to have the negativity, mm-hmm. but I'm sure it, like when you first said, hey, I want to do this, you, it was like, I just, I just want to go try it. Right. It doesn't yeah. like, you probably didn't like when, just from listening, you talk about it, it wasn't like you weren't trying to be some huge trendsetter. It's just like, I just want to try it. And yeah. at some point you just like, I just want to go wrestle. I, mm-hmm. I don't need to have it be a production. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately you use the word production. Unfortunately it was. Oh, um, I'm sure. It, I, if you go out and, and Google my maiden name, I mean, the, there were newspapers that wrote articles and uh, one of the pictures ended up getting picked up by the Associated Press. And so it got put into Newsweek magazine. And so that's when, I mean, that's when I got letters from Ugh. all over the country because my picture was just out there in local papers, in Pennsylvania, in local papers, uh, you know, all over the place. And um, yeah, I got asked to be on talk shows. I, there was um, a program on PBS that I got to 
be on as a guest. Um, that one was pretty cool, actually. It was a show called Energy Express. Um, but yeah, it was a production. And the first year, I understood to some sure. extent. But by the third year, I was over it. You yeah. know, and my teammates were over it. And and that was the hard part too, is my teammates um for the most part supported me. But there were the ones that were like they also they're like, We just wanna wrestle. We just wanna be here for the sport. Sure. There's no and especially it, you know, like I said, I, I didn't have a ton of success. I became more successful over time. But I, I was you would not look me up and say, Wow, she had a really impressive record. No. But you know, there were amazing athletes on my team and they're not getting the recognition that right. they deserve for being amazing athletes in the sport of wrestling. I'm getting all this recognition because I'm a girl. Yeah. Right. So, um, so that part was a little tricky, you know, managing that and trying to be polite to the people who had questions and wanted to know why, but also trying to support and be respectful to my team and my coach so that it's not Margaret show. Yeah. What's the, uh, what are the, what are the, the lessons that you've learned that you learned taking from that experience that you're like, I know that I do this well because of that. Anything you can, you know, point your finger at it, that it had to, it had to uh, develop your character in some way. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It ha there's no way that doesn't, that doesn't affect you. Mm -hmm. Whether or not mm -hmm. you've whether or not you've asked yourself that question, I don't mean to like pry yeah. too much, but I'm just curious. Oh no, no, there's definitely the last when my daughter decided to wrestle. Um, I will say that I had kind of put that whole experience and that whole time frame of my life kind of like in a box and put it on a shelf, right? Like this was then, and it was done, and it was awesome, and there was so much good about it but it was that part of my life. Right. And I, I put it away and I put it on a shelf and then I had moved into this like season of motherhood and being a wife and being an adult and um, all of those, all the things that go along with that. And so then that's what I was in. And so it, that was just part of my history and it was on a shelf and it was there. And um, when my daughter finally decided that she was going to wrestle, um, that box kind of had to come back down yeah. and be reopened and revisited in a lot of ways. And some of it was really good. And some of it was really hard to like reflect back on some of those harder experiences of being mistreated, misunderstood, uh, what, however you want to phrase it. But um, so in all of that reflection and revisiting the, the big thing that I come back to over and over again, and we talk to our wrestlers in the room about it, is I can do hard things. Like I just tell myself I can do hard things and hard things look a lot of different ways, right? They, the physical aspect of it, like I can do hard things. I took up running uh, during COVID. I mean, you said you've done some run road races and things like that. I did track in high school, but not, I, I did like sprints and things like that. Um, but during COVID I had all this time. And so I took yeah. up running and I decided to challenge myself and just one day said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to run 10 miles. I'm going to run 10 miles on my birthday. And so I trained and I set this whole schedule and man, I'd never done that before. And you yeah. hit those, you, you hit mile five and when you still have more miles to go and you know, you just have that in your head, I can do hard things. And mm -hmm. you have to teach yourself to say those things in your head because your brain is, is trying to protect your body. Yeah, And it's trying to tell your body, you need to stop because this is hard and you're going to hurt yourself. So stop. So it's like tricking your body to follow your brain and filling your brain with those things of, I can do hard things. I can do hard things. And so there's been other situations in my life unrelated to physical challenges where uh, my husband is 32 years, almost 33 years in the army. And um, he did have to deploy, thankfully, only once. And that's really hard and it's really overwhelming and it was a lot and our kids were young our kids were four and six and um i'd never been a single parent before and kudos to all the single parents out there holy cow it's hard yeah. um but i can do hard things you know and when the overwhelm comes in and that that list of oh my gosh i have all these things to do and how am i going to handle this and how am i going to do that and who am i going to reach out for that i can do hard things it's like 
I, I can get it done, you know. Uh, Margaret, you could like I could, I got like fourteen thousand questions just from that what you were just saying right there because yeah. okay that's maybe but just so many points to come out with and I, I love to say the idea that if if we if we put ourselves through intentional adversity, we're better prepared for mandatory adversity that's going to mm. come up later, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It, it, and and you and you you get I love that, that right? Idea of mandatory adversity because well, that's what life throws at us. Life, right? Yeah, life happens. Life life happens. does. But yeah. I think that if you're better prepared, if you put yourself through intentional adversity, like you you deciding to do wrestling as a kid, and you just said, "Hey, for my birthday, I'm going to go run ten miles." Like that's intentional adversity. You don't have to do that. Right. Right. But if you do those things and you accomplish them, what it's a such a confidence boost so that when you say I can do hard things, you actually have Mm -hmm. evidence that I can do hard things. You're like, well, I've done that. Well, I can do this. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, plus, when you're talking about telling your brain to do that. I, I don't know how to say this, but our brains aren't as complicated as we think they are, right? Like yeah. it, you can trick, you can absolutely, you can absolutely start to trick your brain. Now you can't, mm-hmm. I don't think you can do it immediately. I think you can start to practice it and say, I can do hard things. I can do hard things. And if that becomes part of your mantra and then you go out there and try to do mm-hmm. hard things, you'll eventually be able to be somebody who can do hard things. Do it's hard not, things, yeah. it's not overnight, but you can turn yourself into that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I also noticed that you talked about having to bring that box back down off the shelf, right? Yeah. And you get people like me that contact you after all this, right? Which, but <laughs> you know, we'll not get into that. And you mentioned that it brought back all the stuff that you had to go through. And you mentioned the, you gave, you came up with more of the emotional stuff than you did the actual physical stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think that we get so scared of the physical stuff, but that when you, that gets over and done with and is never as bad as we think it is. And we, and it, but it's the emotional stuff that really kind of sticks with us sometimes. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you can, it's kind of like, uh, you know, they say that all the time about childbirth. People would never have more than one, one <laughs> baby if their bodies, if you actually remembered what childbirth was like, you know, the brain, um, brain helps block, Mm-hmm. the the actual memories of the hard physical part and holds on to hopefully the positive part some people do have traumatic births and so you know sure their brain holds on to the trauma and they also don't want to have more children but um yeah i mean it it was 30 years ago the last time i competed was in 20 or was in 1994 so 30 years ago was the last time that i competed um was the summer of 1994 and um I could give you a, I could say that I have a sense of remembering how hard it was physically. And that just mostly comes from the fact that I do still get on the mat with my athletes. Um, and so my body remembers yeah. what, how hard it is physically. Um, and it feels a whole lot different oh, when you're oh, yeah, yeah. When <laughs> yeah. wrestling with 15, 16 year old girls. Um, that that's a whole different, a whole different thing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there were, there, there were definitely, it's definitely more emotional. And, um, I think my emotional connections with wrestling are overly complicated, um, more than the average athlete. Cause it's not just about, I can do hard things of the physical part, but yeah, it's like, I had to constantly just overcome people's opinions of me, people's perceptions of me, um, and just still do what I wanted to do and what I felt was the right choice for me. And, but let's, let's be honest, flash forward, like you said, 30 years, it, it's still not like there's, there we're three years into the IHSA girls wrestling, but it's not like it's, there's still not an overabundance of female wrestlers. You'd actually be shocked. You'd well, be shocked. I mean, compared to boys, no. Yes. But, yeah. But for statistical purposes, 2022 was the first state tournament. There were 500 girls that started the state series. One year later, there were over 900 girls that oh, started fantastic. the state series. This year, there were 1,400 that started the state series. We had over 2,400 girls in the state of Illinois who were registered in the track wrestling 
system like as competitors in the state. So 300% growth. Oh, that's um, great. That, but, I mean, that's fantastic. But you still have to go out and recruit girls, don't you? Oh, 100%. Yeah. See, that, and that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's not like it's not commonplace yet. Like no. you have to go sell them on the idea. Oh yeah. And every single girl, I was like, you should come out for wrestling. They're like me. No, no. <laughs> every, every single girl I have yet to have one who's like, Oh yeah, that that's exactly, uh, that sounds like exactly what I need to do. I'm like, <laughs> no, right. No, not yet. Haven't had that yet. I'm waiting for that day. Well, well so what's, your, what's the pitch? Um, honestly, part of the pitch is that it's me. Like they see me, I'm the coach. Um, I can tell my story. That's part of it, you know, and they can see that I'm, I mean, I can be kind of intense sometimes, but overall, you know, I'm still only five foot one, you know, I'm not this, you know, big, scary person. And, um, that's part of it. And part of it is, you know, we're like, well, if you're not doing anything in the winter, why not come, come learn about yourself, come see how strong you are and, and be with a great group of friends. Um, because any wrestler you talk to, if they're with a program with any, uh, kind of depth to it, they'll tell you that it, it's like a family, the number mm -hmm. of hours and the intensity of the time that you spend together, um, just grows a culture of closeness that is really different than any other sport. Um, and, with this shift of the growth and girls being in it, that's one of the biggest differences that I see. Like going to these all girls competitions is beautiful. Um, seeing these girls support each other, even if they're not on the same team. Um, the very first one I went to, I literally was having to keep myself from crying because just oh. seeing that, just the quantity of girls there, first of all, but just how they were still just girls. You know, they're still just girls braiding each other's hair, talking to each other, laughing, goofing around, but genuinely being supportive of each other, um, cheering for each other, watching out for each other. Like the amount of hugging that happens at girls wrestling is crazy. Um, you know, even after they, even after they, you know, pin their opponent, they're like, oh, good job, you know, and hugging each other. And um, so I can't help but hear you say you heard when you your the start of your pitch was you said come learn about yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I I need I think I know where you're coming from, but I want you I want I want to hear it from you. Want to hear more? <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. Um, wrestling is the hardest. That's the other half of it that we always say. Uh, wrestling is the hardest thing you will ever do. Um, and you can't fully explain it because until you experience it, and like you said, you went out for and tried jujitsu and you're like, wow, this is, this is the real deal. Like it puts you in that position again, because it's just you and your opponent in that competition ring. It's just you and your opponent. There's no one coming to save you. There's no one that you can you know, look to for that rebound or that pass or, you know, who someone else who's going to score that goal for you or score that basket so that you can have the glory or the victory, right? It's just you, it's just you and your opponent. And um, learning how a, a big thing that I always worry about with girls in particular is that they don't know how strong they are and not just physically, but more so emotionally that you can be in these hard situations, these hard physical situations, specifically in wrestling. Practice every day is hard, right? Competitions are really hard. That you can be in these really hard situations and whether you come out victorious or that you learned something during that match or that practice, that you made it through, right? You made it through, you came out on the other side and you either were victorious or you learned something. And maybe you learned that day, I didn't like how it feels to not be victorious. Yeah. Or maybe I, you learned a specific move, right? Or maybe you learned, wow, I can really push myself that much further than I thought I could yesterday. Yeah. Right? And, um, and wrestling just, just kind of breeds that in you because it is so intense and 
It's just you. Like you have to count on yourself. You can't make chicken salad out of chicken feathers, or perhaps you've heard it or even said the other version. Regardless, good coaches should not blame a lack of success on the players they get to coach. It's a lame excuse, and I'm sorry if that ruffles your feathers. But it's your job as a coach to develop your players. If your athletes lack skill or mental toughness, it's your responsibility to develop it. But how do you make today's athlete tougher without risking breaking them? Well, Mental Metal Coaching now offers professional development for coaches explaining how to do just that. The program is called Ember to Inferno, Building Mentally Tough Athletes. It teaches real tools and tangible methods that are proven to increase the mental health and toughness of athletes. The program is available as an in-person seminar or as virtual small group coaching. Don't wish for mentally tough athletes. Build them. Contact Mental Metal Coaching today. Metal is a person's ability to face adversity in a spirited and resilient manner. It is a great skill to have for athletics and for life, but it is not something we are born with. If you want it, you have to forge your metal. And if you listen to the Mental Metal Podcast, you already know that, but not everybody else does yet. So help me out by ordering and wearing some sweet The Mental Metal Podcast gear. We've got short sleeve tees, long sleeve tees, and some super comfortable hoodies. Order online today and you can have your gear in no time. But the best part is that every order helps support the show and helps me spread the message that mental toughness is a trait that can and should be built. So find the link in the show notes, order your gear, and start showing that you know how to forge your metal. Yeah, the, the whole way you talk, Margaret, I absolutely love it. Just the, <laughs> you, you throw out these little bits of wisdom that you're not even realize you're saying it when you said, I'm going to go out and I can either be victorious and I, or I can learn something that day. And mm-hmm. it's like that, I, that entire idea of winning and losing and look at like I, I competed and I got the end goal of winning, but it's not like it's an it it's not like the the opposite is a loss or a failure it's it's learning mm-hmm. and i know how that sounds when kids hear that and some adults like like oh if you're talking about how losses are are an opportunity to to learn you must be a loser right and i'm like no that's that's not you know what i mean and that's not what it's about mm-hmm. No, you learn learn so much more. You learn so much more through those losses than you do through the victories. Because, of course, it feels good to win, right? So you learn through through those victories, through winning. You learn that over and over again. I like winning. I like the way it feels to win. But beyond that, like, what are what are you learning? Something. Yeah, and, and the not other that I'm si- saying that you should go out there to lose. And no, I, I agree. But the other victory. side of it is, I think it changes our perspective on winning as well, because I mm. think that when we do win, we also have to be very, we have to have a lot of recognition and give ourselves some gratitude for actually winning. Because I think mm-hmm. sometimes we don't do that either. Whenever we yeah. look at it from the winning and losing, it's like, well, I'm supposed to win, right? <laughs> right. So I'm not going to give myself any any celebration whatsoever because I'm supposed to win. Well, no, because that doesn't help us either. We've got to have some of that celebration for yeah. like, Oh, I did this. I did this right. I did this well. And I was victorious. You have to recognize that and celebrate that about yourself. If you want to gain confidence, otherwise you're just, for sure. you're forgetting it. Mm-hmm. And so I think just the whole, the whole way of looking at it is so much better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what I reflect back on it. So, one little tidbit that I didn't throw out there um, that you'll you'll probably enjoy this. So my husband has been my biggest fan um, ever since we met. Um, he'll tell the story all the time of how we met and um, he tried to um, throw me, like do a lateral drop because we were at a rock climbing gym and there was a crash pad and I countered it and he didn't throw me and he was like what is going on and he didn't know I wrestled and then uh so that was that was like before we even started dating so that's how he always like prefaces the story of like so you have to hear this when I first met her but you know he like I said I I had put all that experience kind of away and any opportunity he had to tell people like do you know who this is like do you know what she's done um (laughs) 
he would tell anybody, but he always started my story at the end. Um, so after I graduated high school, I did compete in one girls series. Um, and it was the, at the national level, I decided I'm going to go give it a try. I'm going to go out to Las Vegas and I'm going to wrestle in nationals. And, um, my friend's dad came with me as my coach, um, cause he had all of his boys had wrestled. And so he came with me. My parents didn't even come with me. It was, it was me and Chuck. Um, and we went out to this tournament and I ended up placing second at nationals. And I was like, Ooh, that's cool. And yeah. I got to wrestle against girls. And I was like, wow, I am really successful when I'm going against, you know, equal competitors. This is kind of cool. And then I was getting ready to go away to college. Like I had graduated high school. I had plans to go to college. And so I was like, oh, that, that was cool. I'm glad I experienced that. Check done. Like I wasn't planning on continuing my wrestling career after that. In the middle of the summer, I got a phone call. And they said, hey, so uh, the person that beat you at nationals, she can't actually compete at the world championships that are coming up in August. So we would like you to come out to... Um, New York to the Olympic Training Center and have a wrestle off against this other competitor. And whichever of you wins will be going and representing the United States at the World Championships. And I was like, um, sure. Yeah, uh, I was I mean, yeah. 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 I was literally like laying, we had a pool and I was laying next to the pool eating brownies when this phone call came in. And so, uh, not, not, <laughs> like I'm kind of actually having a time, good time mm, not yeah, making weight of, here. Yeah. Kind of experiencing my summer. But, um, yeah. so needless to say, I went out to New York. I, uh, we had the wrestle offs. I won the wrestle offs. So I was invited to be part of the team. Got to go to the world championships in Bulgaria in 1994 and I got a silver medal. So I have a, I have a world medal. Like, hanging in a frame in my house. Uh, I'm one of few, right? There, there yeah. aren't that many uh, who have that. But to me, that's the end of my story. And that was the easy part. Like that was the, the victory that I experienced at the end, like the, the like tangible, I can hold it in my hand, look at the silver medal I have. And that's the part of the story that my husband would always tell people like, Do you know, she has a silver medal from the world championships. Like she was the bomb, you know? And I'm always like, mm, like, eh. You, you skipped all the other part, but he, yeah. and he didn't know me during any of it. Um, you know, he, we didn't know each other in high school. So to him, it is just a story. And that is the only visible, tangible thing that he sees. And like how you were asking me about, like, I brought up the emotional part of it because that's what I feel like yeah. I carry with me all these years is like all the emotional feelings about my experience is what has carried through all these years. And so, um, and I don't even remember why I ended up telling you that, but you know, that, that just that win versus loss victories versus learning, you know, he's been it's, a coach for a long time. He's been around the sport for a long time. Like he sees that thing hanging on the wall and he's like, man, that is so cool. That is such like that pinnacle experience, which in a way. Yeah, it and that's it. And that's it, Mark. It's the, the pinnacle experience that we think we want yeah. is it's great. It's great but it's not the experience and right. it's not, it's not what really, what, what builds us and what we have to go through is what really sticks with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you had, you know, if you had never done the, you know, the nationals and the, uh, you know, world championships, your story isn't a whole lot different. Right. Right. Uh, and I think people miss that. Like they, they set out to want to win something big and they if that's your only focus you miss you miss all the benefits along the way yeah and for me i almost feel like it was that icing on the cake it was like oh. man like especially now looking back on it 30 years later that i can be like all that work i did in high school when i didn't like reap the rewards. I didn't see that tangible success. I didn't have a silver medal or medal tournament medals, a collection of them from my high school career. But I did all that work and I was learning that whole time through all those losses and through all the adversity and through all the practices and all that hard work. Look at look at what I got at the end. Like I, I got this silver medal and it was really cool. Um and it yeah, was an absolutely. amazing experience, right? Um but it's really interesting now as this growth 
is happening in girls wrestling. And I'm finding myself kind of in the middle of it again, right? I, my daughter made the decision to join. She ended up qualifying for state at the first and the second tournament, um, participated in the state tournament, watching that growth. I'm now getting invited to be, you know, a voice in decisions that are being made related to it um, at the state level. And it's almost like getting that second kind of pinnacle moment where I feel like I'm climbing this way towards something, but I don't know what that something is yet. Um, Because I don't know what I don't know what my big picture goal is other than like, I want to see it continue to grow. Right. Like yeah. I have, I have small measurable goals that I would love to see happen with my team at normal West, but big picture, like we have a state tournament now. Could it be better? Yes. Um, we have, you know, it's sanctioned in our state, which is awesome. Um, do we need it to be exactly equal to boys? I don't know because girls are different, you know, it's the same sport, but it's still different with it being girls. So I feel like I'm almost on that. Like, climb towards some sort of pinnacle, but I don't know what it is yet. Yeah. I haven't quite figured out what it is yet. But. Well, yeah. If I can go back to your original story, you didn't know what the pinnacle was then either. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I yeah. think, but I think that that the pinnacle or what we think is going to be the pinnacle sometimes gets in the way, mm-hmm. right? It, it clouds us. It, it clouds our decisions and it makes us, really get upset with when we're not making the progress we want. But when you don't have that, it, like, you know, the idea of like focus on the process, right? It, everything you're doing is all about the process, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's what we tell people to do, but you don't even like, it's like, it's just a backwards way to do it because that's not how we think we're supposed to do things. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you're supposed to well, go and in I and think, be like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes even what we think is that pinnacle goal isn't in the end. Like, and no. I think you were hitting on that. Like you think that, like I didn't set a goal for getting a silver medal, but some people might say like, oh, that was your pinnacle moment, right? Because it's kind of that highest achievement that I reached in the sport. Um, but it wasn't ever my goal. Like my goal was always just to compete. Like I wanted to be part of the sport. And and I think for me, that's a big part of it now is just I want to continue to see people fall, people boys and girls fall in love with the sport because yeah, but that, that should be more people. I just feel like that should be more people's goal, right? Oh, I want to, I want to compete. I want to get better and I want to enjoy the sport. Well, mm-hmm. what's wrong with that? Right. I, 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 why do we have to have these huge goals about what we're trying to do? Because mm-hmm. the thing is, if you go out there, compete, you try to get better and enjoy yourself, the wins and the pinnacles seem to follow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. E- Yeah. So I'd love to get your perspective on, I I end up working because I do a lot of individual coaching with athletes and I work with guys and I work with girls and you know, they're different, right? And girls really, it's not a hundred percent, but some girls, girls tend to struggle with the self-confidence a little bit more. Right. Um, Where does that factor in and you helping with that and, building that confidence for these girls that decide to wrestle. Do you see that? Um, for sure. Um, sorry, the dog is. No, you're fine. (laughs) Um, yeah. And I, I think that's, it's interesting that you ask about that because I feel like sports in general are a great way to build self-confidence because self is self, right? And so, and wrestling in particular, because it's just you out there, I think there is a uh, faster path potentially towards self-confidence as you become successful at something new, especially. And, but coming in, I do feel like it's not that they're necessarily lacking self-confidence as much as they are lacking lacking a boldness that boys naturally have. Yes. And they are much more aware of others watching them and worried about how others perceive them. So they're worried about 
oh, well, if I do it wrong, someone might laugh at me or might make fun of me or might um, pick on me. And it's not necessarily, I guess that's in some ways self-confidence, but um, but yeah, it's just, we get boys come into the program because we still practice together. Boys right. and girls still all practice together for us because our team hasn't gotten big enough yet and we don't have enough space yet. And I, I like to use yet because, you know, that whole. Oh, absolutely. That's my I guess that's my pinnacle moment is I, I'm looking for someone out there who wants to, like, build us a facility so that we can oh. have our own space. But um, but, you know, we practice in the same space. And so I can see it every day at practice, the the difference every day at practice between boys and girls. And we have boys come in who have never done the sport before and just their willingness to just jump in and try something new, even though they have no idea how to do it. They've never done anything like that with their body before either. They're just like, oh, so like this. And if they do it wrong, they just laugh it off and they try again, or they are willing to ask more questions. Um, I will say overall that the girls um, that we have gotten on our pro in our program and on our team have been really great about being willing to ask the questions. Um, they have shown that desire to get better and be better at the sport and to learn it. Um, they're not, they're not just hanging out, hoping that, you know, organically, they're just going to absorb it through osmosis or something like that. And they're yeah. just, they're going to wake up the next day and know how to do the things. Um, so they do ask a lot of questions, which is good. Um, but, but I, I will say, yeah, there is definitely a difference as they come in. I don't know if I would necessarily pinpoint it as self-confidence as much as yeah. Just and that. that may not be it, but, but there's definitely a difference. And, mm -hmm. and I, but whatever, whatever the difference is getting those girls in to wrestle has to be helping that, mm -hmm. that with their own self-confidence or whatever it is, their willingness to, to try things and to get better at that. Yeah. Whatever that gap is. Yeah. Yeah. And just that willingness to try something new and different and, yeah. you know, and to do hard things so that it's better for things. them. And yeah. so that it's better for them. In the long run. Yeah. 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 Because wrestling is really hard. And if you can make it through some really hard things, those other things that you used to think were really hard are going to feel not so hard anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. More people should do it. Wrestling, everything, just more hard things. I, I think mm -hmm. it's a lot of people's. Yeah. It's, it's what's missing for a lot of people is just not doing hard things. I think we need to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Margaret. Last question here. What did I not ask that I should have in this whole story? What did I not, what, what did I not, what avenue did I not go down that I should have, that I missed? Hmm. I don't know. I feel like we kind of hit on, hit on all the big, the big topics. Um, well, I, you say that, but you were about to let go that you had a, a silver molt, a medal in the worlds and you finally <laughs> and told that story. I told so that there's story, gotta be, yeah. there's gotta be some sort of gym that, that is uncovered. Yeah. Well, but I, again, that's just, it, I feel sometimes like that's just part of my story. Mm -hmm. It's not part of like the story. It's just my, my personal, um, part in it, but, um, yeah. I mean, just big picture. I just feel like, and you hit on it, like people just need, need to put themselves in positions to do hard things, try hard things and just quit being so afraid, you know, to try hard things because it, you can try something hard and you might fail at it and that's okay. Right. Because you're still there and you're going to come back tomorrow and maybe you'll decide not to do that particular hard thing again. But you did it. You tried it. And it wasn't your thing. Great. Move on to the next. But um, so many people just live in fear of failure that they aren't willing to just step up and try something new and try something hard. and maybe make a fool of themselves. I don't know. Like I, <laughs> and that's part of it. And, but yeah, learning it's, it's a trick is being able to like, being able to put yourself in hard situations and face adversity on purpose and actually enjoy it. Yeah. Is it, it it's something you have to develop, but it's mm -hmm. worth it to do that. Mm -hmm. I think 
but it's hard to tell people that if they don't, it's hard for people to understand that if you don't do that and you just say, Hey, I don't, why would I do something that's hard? It's hard. It's hard. Why would I do it on purpose? And it's like, because well, complacency is a whole lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. I know. <laughs> right? like, I, I know. Like, I know. I yeah. feel like and we're on our, so we're, we're, I feel like we're on our soap boxes now, but that's okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, our 47 I, year old soap boxes. Right? I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's okay though. I think it's, I think it's a good place. I, I have no problem preaching that message that mm -hmm. that's what we ought to be doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that, um, I do think some of it is generational. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I joined wrestling in the early nineties. I have parents who are now approaching 80 and, um, you know, so they're post world war two, uh, you know, the boomers and, mm -hmm. um, life was different mm -hmm. then when I, you know, did make that decision to be the first and part of it, a big part of it for me was being raised by parents who um, allowed me those opportunities to try new things. Like my parents knew nothing about wrestling. And I think that was actually probably a good thing because if yeah. they really knew um, all that I was going to go through and how hard it really was, they probably potentially would have discouraged me from yeah. doing it. But instead they encouraged me because they said, sure, why not? Just know that it might be really hard, but that's okay. And, um, I guess that would be my only other takeaway as, uh, you know, just also be an encourager to others, um, whether you're a parent, whether you're a caregiver in some way, um, just if you're, if you have influence around young people, but it doesn't even have to be young people. Um, cause I think that it's easier to train young people to be willing to do hard things than yep. it is like someone our age, um, it just becomes scarier and harder, um, to, to teach them. So if you have influence in the world of young people right now, encourage them to, to try the thing, whatever the thing is, try the thing. Yeah. If they've ever been curious about it, try the thing. Um, I teach a class right now and we um, do some gratitude journaling in it. And today's today we're doing a full week of it this week. And today for Tuesday was uh, the prompt was I told them to write down today. I am brave, period. One thing I have always wanted to do is dot, dot, dot. And then make a list of at least three things that they were going to do to work towards that thing. Because I told them, I said, some days you just have to tell yourself, I am brave. Yeah. Like, you know, so it's, if you have. Like I said, our, our minds aren't as compliment, or complicated as we think. We can, we can, tr we can trick our brains. There, yeah. it, it's, it's possible to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nah, so I love that. that. Yeah. So I guess my one other takeaway would be like, if whoever's listening to this, if you have, if you have any sort of influence in, in the life of someone young, encourage them now to try hard things. Yeah. And, and things. be fine if it doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah. What'd you expect it? Yeah. It's supposed yeah. to be hard. That's it's the whole, hard. the harder yeah. it is, the more you're going to fail and the better yeah. that, that, the, the better that is. So, yeah. and that it's okay for things to be hard. Yeah. I think so many, so many parents, um, you know, there was a, a stretch of time where so many parents just, and I, I get it. I am a parent. Like it, it's hard watching your kids go through hard mm -hmm. things, but how are they going to know how to go through hard things if you don't let them go through hard things? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it's as simple it's, as that. Yeah, right? I know. It's, yep. I know. It, it's, yeah, it's it's a really simple idea that we just gotta keep keep pushing for young people and people of all ages, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, Margaret, uh, phenomenal uh, talking to you. I uh, I love so much what you're saying, and I the the question that I said that what did you take away from that experience that you put into your life now? Like, you don't even see it. But it's, mm -hmm. it's there, right? The stuff that you're doing with your kids and your athletes and your students, it's all part of it. It's, it's, there's no way that didn't shape and mold you into the, the what you are, the, the role model you are now. So I commend you for that. Yeah. So thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it a lot too. Thank you. Mm-hmm. 
Parents of athletes know that confidence and belief are fundamental for success. We want them to play without fear and without anxiety, but once those negative thoughts take over, it can derail years of work. Turning that anxiety into belief is similar to building strength and speed. It just takes intentional effort over time. Mental Metal Coaching provides the individual drills needed to build the positive mindset necessary for success on the court and in life. Contact today to schedule a free coaching session and start building mental toughness in your athlete. Metal is a person's ability to face adversity in a spirited and resilient manner. It is a great skill to have for athletics and for life, but it is not something we are born with. If you want it, you have to forge your metal. And if you listen to the Mental Metal Podcast, you already know that, but not everybody else does yet. So help me out by ordering and wearing some sweet The Mental Metal Podcast gear. We've got short sleeve tees, long sleeve tees, and some super comfortable hoodies. Order online today and you can have your gear in no time. But the best part is that every order helps support the show and helps me spread the message that mental toughness is a trait that can and should be built. So find the link in the show notes, order your gear, and start showing that you know how to forge your metal. That right there is what I'm talking about. That is the finished product. That is the after in the before and after picture. Margaret Lear, coach of the Normal West girls wrestling coach, is the poster child of what I'm talking about about how if you do things hard, if you do men, you know intentionally hard things and put yourself through things and, and push yourself and how that develops character and how that develops us into a, a strong, confident person with, you know, that, that is a great example of metal, right? Uh, just, Talking to her, there was this is the first time I've ever talking to talked to her, and I she so many of the things she she gets it on. She understands how to lead athletes through trying situations. She understands how to lead athletes in a difficult sport. She's trying. She knows how understands how to lead girls into a sport that's not traditional for girls, and and how difficult that is. And she understands with her athletes how to focus on the growth rather than the wins and how to how to use uh, failures as a positive. And she may not see it, but I, I see so much of that. Uh, just her putting herself through some very difficult situations. I see so much of that being uh, just at the forefront of the way she coaches. And it's just... And I believe that it's it's all a big part of her being intentional when she was young and doing something that was really hard I, and and being supported to go through that. Uh, it is it is the that is what we're after whenever we're tra- talking about putting ourselves through hard things as an adult. I don't think it's ever too late to do that. I think that you need to be finding your hard thing to do. And I think you need to go find something and something difficult. And I know that uh, I threw out, I th- we throw out these difficult things. Like, you know, I'll mention about st- picking up jujitsu and you're like, I'm not doing that. And that's fine. And you might say, I'm not, I'm not in shape to go run a marathon and that's fine. But I think you got to find something. You have to find something that challenges you physically and mentally, I think you need to find something to do that. I think as an adult, I think we need to keep pushing. And then once you really push that on yourself a little bit, I think that's something we need to be pushing with kids more. And your kids as well as your adult, uh, your athletes, if, if you're a coach. And, but there's a right way to do it. I, I think that we can't just say, here's some hard things to my athletes on my team and you need to go do it and just start putting them through all difficult situations just because you think it'll make them harder or you're going to make, tell our kid to go do this because it'll make because it's difficult. It, yeah, that needs to be part of it, but I think it's the mentality. It's 
explained it to them that this is why we're doing this. We're doing some things hard on purpose because it's going to make us better. And this is our goal. And it's okay if we lose. It's okay if we fail. But we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep pushing. We're going to do this hard thing and so that we can see the benefits once we get on the other side of it. And if you have an athlete that is really struggling with that and you're like, hey, we're trying. We're trying to put him in hard thing, put him or her through some difficult things and difficult situations. And they just they just can't get it and they can't get past the discomfort. They can't get past the the fear. Honestly, that's where I can come in. That's one of the things I really helped with was kids and athletes that are struggling with anxiety. They love a sport, but it's gotten really hard or some of the situations in the sport have gotten really difficult and they can't get past the fear and they can't get past the anxiety and they can't get past the discomfort and don't see the point anymore and don't want to do things that are difficult. And that's a that's one of the number one things I work with with athletes is they're they just can't get past that and they can't see the benefit of those difficult things and that that adversity and seeing that adversity for uh, what it is, which is a you know a stepping stone to becoming better and becoming great. So if you're like, Hey, I I know that I need to put this on my athlete or my kid and I know they need to do this, but they're really struggling to do that. Maybe it's because we didn't do enough when they were younger or something happened, whatever. Then that's what I'm here for. That's what I do. That's what I love to do. I love to take a kid that is struggling in their sport, in this sport that they used to love and they used to love it because it was hard and they, and they love to compete. And now they're, they're upside down on it and they hate getting to practice and they hate losing and they just full of anxiety about it. That's what I love doing. I love helping them change their mind, putting time and effort into this positive psychology and changing things around so that they can learn to accept the difficulties and accept the adversity in a positive way and see this as a way of growth so that they can end up being like I said, being like what I was talking about about Margaret is that end result. We know we know the benefit of athletics if we do it right, but you have to do it right. You have to understand that losing is okay. You have to understand that it's hard on purpose, and you have to understand that that adversity is what makes us better. And if you can do that, if you can help your kid do that, if they're not if they're on their own, fantastic. Keep encouraging it. If they're struggling to do that. That's where you can ask somebody like me to help. But if we can do that, we all know the end result is we get this extremely confident woman like Margaret who is leading others and, and you know, just guiding them. And that's, that's the beauty of athletics. Just the absolute beauty of it. That's why I do it. That's why I love what I'm doing. That's what I love about athletics. So um, by all means, if you have any questions about coaching, contact me. All right. Share this with somebody who might need it. All right. Uh, There's a need out there for athletes, for coaches to do things the right way and uh, face that adversity and do hard things on purpose. So it's out there. Share my stuff. I would appreciate it. Share the podcast, share my information, and let's see if we can do this together and start moving, um, moving, moving forward on some of these things. Cause I think the benefit is well worth it. So As always, thank you for listening. Remember to like, share, subscribe, all of these things. Uh, Just by sharing, you never know. You might really change somebody's life. So uh, I would appreciate if you do that. This has been The Mental Metal Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Matt Toman. And remember, forge your metal. Thanks again for listening to The Mental Metal Podcast, produced by Coraggio Media, sponsored by Quick Cut, a video management platform for every level of play, and by Mental Metal Coaching helping athletes learn to face adversity in a spirited and resilient way. The Mental Metal Podcast is created each week to help players develop more mental toughness, and that is something that will help all of us. So help me out and like and share the Mental Metal Podcast with your friends. Until next time, keep forging your metal.